In this module, we're going to look at some of the early thinkers that uh, influenced the development of the web. Uh, these visionaries tried to develop uh, information organization systems, uh, and in doing so, they had to tackle some of the problems that would later confront Tim Berners-Lee in developing the World Wide Web. Uh, in, the, in the process of looking at this history and these thinkers, we're going to try and uh, keep in mind, uh, try and tease out uh, some of the, the uh, concerns they were trying to address, uh, as well as some of the problems they encountered in their work. Uh, so, Paul Oatley is one of the, the considered one of the founding fathers of information science. Uh, and unquestionably one of these early thinkers uh, who developed an information system that went on to influence uh, several later thinkers. Uh, he envisioned the creation of a kind of an artificial brain uh, that would organize facts gleaned from scientific articles and publications these facts would be recorded on a 3x5 card and then linked together through a what he called the universal decimal classification system. Um, so this linking, uh, this connection between these individual facts, he referred to as a monographic principle. Uh, he uh, he had a vision of creating a, uh, a world city, um, a, a city of knowledge in which all of the world's information and knowledge could be gathered uh, and stored in these 3 by 5 cards and linked together. He actually was able to establish uh, what he called the Mundanian, um, and at its peak it had over 15 million index cards. Uh, the system collapsed uh, mainly due to uh, the amount of physical space it took to store all these cards and, and work uh, that it took to keep them up to date and organized. Uh, this is his own description of, of this of his idea. The ideal would be to strip each article or each chapter in a book of whatever is a matter of fine language or repetition or padding and to collect separately on cards whatever is new and adds to knowledge. These cards, minutely subdivided, each one annotated as to the genus and species of the information they contain, because they are separate, could then be accurately placed in a general alphabetical catalog updated each day. So another early thinker that was uh, heavily influenced by uh, Otle was Wilhelm Ostwald. Uh, he was a, a chemist, a famous chemist. He actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1909. Uh, he met Otle in Brussels in 1910 uh, and was uh, very excited about his ideas. Um, he used some of the money most of the money from his Nobel Prize to begin a similar institute in Germany, which was called the, the Bridge. Uh, it was an, an international institute for organizing knowledge work. Uh, he adopted the monographic principle, the universal classification system from Paul Oatley. Uh, he's had a heavy influence on, on his own system. Um, and he also is responsible for standard paper sizes. The system, the, the bridge, the institute, ended up collapsing in 1913. Um, but we still have standard paper sizes, uh, and his work is still you know, influential in terms of the development of the web. Uh, another thinker, coming at it from a different discipline, different angles, H.G. Uh, Wells. Uh, and this quote um, really is very reminiscent of, of the, the web. He kind of envisioned, he said he envisioned an efficient index to all human knowledge, ideas, and achievements. 
to the creation that is of a complete planetary memory for all mankind. It need not be concentrated in one single place. It is difficult not to believe that in quite the near future, this permanent world encyclopedia, so compact in its material form and so gigantic in its scope and possible influence, will not come into existence. Uh, so you can see, you know, clearly the, uh, the relationship between this idea, this, the similarities between this idea and the, and the World Wide Web. Uh, it doesn't need to be stored in a single place. It's a, it's a distributed information system that houses all the world's knowledge. Um, you know, the scope and influence of uh, H.G. Wells' writing uh, obviously makes him a... a a figure that needs to be considered in, in any uh, history of the development of the web. Uh, another thinker is named Emmanuel Goldberg. He developed the first functioning microfilm document retrieval system in 1927. Uh, he was kidnapped by the Nazis in 1933. And because of this, because of the historical circumstances, the kidnapping, uh, his work was forgotten. He was never really given credit by the company he worked for, uh, for the work he did. Uh, instead, they continued you know, with the work, and uh, he was forgotten until years later um, when his work was rediscovered. And finally, uh, Vannevar Bush is one of the, perhaps one of the most famous of these. Uh, because of his prestige as a scientist in the West, perhaps. Um, but he published an article in The Atlantic in 1945 called As We May Think, in which he described his vision of a personal information machine that he called the Mimics. Um, this personal information machine really is uh, perhaps a little closer linked to the field of personal information management, uh, but it still deals with many of the, the challenges and problems that, that Tim Berners-Lee would have to deal with in the development of the web, and, and therefore is a, is a precedent in, in this, uh, for the web. Um, he also uh, built a, a microfilm rapid selector uh, at MIT in 1930. So returning to these questions we raised at the beginning of the module, uh, what concerns were these thinkers trying to address, and what are some of the problems with these early visions? Uh, you can see a clear pattern in terms of uh, the concerns that all of these thinkers uh, were grappling with this problem of the explosion of knowledge and the difficulty of keeping it all uh, in line, of uh, making researchers aware of the work of other researchers. You know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. One researcher is discovering, uh, working on a problem in Germany. Another researcher is working on the same problem in the US and they have no idea what's going on. Uh, so they were concerned in creating a, a central repository in which all of these researchers could store their knowledge uh, and access the knowledge of others. Uh, so the central repository didn't necessarily have to be housed in a single physical space. Um, you can see that in the, right, in the passage from H.G. Wells. Uh, but uh, it would be a, a centralized, nevertheless, in the sense that um, it's one, one place where all the uh, uh, world's knowledge can be accessed. Uh, so they were concerned quite a bit about this. And many of them were concerned with this kind of globalization of the world, the emergence of a, a, a world community, uh, and the need for the organization of, of knowledge on a world level. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the problems that these early uh, thinkers encountered, you, know, you can see clearly in the case of Otley, uh, that physical space uh, was a tremendous obstacle. We didn't have the technological capacity uh, to use computers to, to store the information. In the physical space, the 15 million cards 
takes out, not to mention the deterioration and maintenance of this, this collection, uh, was a, a tremendous uh, challenge that he, he wasn't able to overcome in the long run. Um, you also see, you know, they run into to, uh, trouble with funding and, and use. Uh, when you have a physical space, you know, people would have to travel from all over the world to get to this space. So there, was, there wasn't necessarily the buy-in that the system would need uh, that we see with the web that actually makes it so successful. So uh, later on, we'll, we'll re-examine these. Uh, problems and, and concerns and see how the web addresses them.